Hello, good evening and welcome. Uh, you can go around the middle. You can go around the middle. Hello. Hello. Good morning. Um, what should you say now? Does that one work too? Does Hello, testing one, two. And Martin's. Yes. Hello. Hello. How was I approached? Sideways. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, uh, about a year before they made it, they, they got in touch with my agent and said, would I, would I be uh, interested in being involved in it? And I said yes, because um, uh, I'd always sworn when I got Doctor Who, because of the nature of my taking over from Colin, I had to go for me dressed as Colin, that um, I would you know, pass it on to the next Doctor Who. So, I seemed an opportunity to do it. And originally I'd heard they were going to do the movie and then I wasn't going to be in it. And then suddenly they got in touch and said, would I do that? So I was quite, that's how it happened really. But it took a long time before it came to fruition, over a year. And then at first they kind of, I thought, well, I'll just be under the titles at the beginning, you know, come out and something will happen and, you know, the new Doctor will take over. And then they sent a script and there was quite a lot of involvement in it. Out of the first 15 minutes, I think, or 15 percent, or 15 something, a quarter of it. And uh, so um, that pleased me a lot. I thought, oh gosh, that's great. And so I really decided to do it. Now, when I signed the, 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 uh, the, uh, the contract, uh, they sent me another script. And they cut it all back again. <laughs> you keep turning that. That's good, because the voice goes funny. <laughs> See? Oh, look. No, the, he's gone off on a trip sometimes. He's got a certain effect on sound. Yes, yeah, so I, I don't know quite what happened there, actually. All right. It's right. got deflected the sound or something. But the battery will run out, you see. It's technical. <laughs> oh, I see. There's a light flashing in about oh, is that yours? Time, although, yes. Oh, I see. Well, it's not mine. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, You made it. I, I made it, yes. Oh, really? I don't know how you got in here, though. <laughs> well, I was one of the smallest actors. <laughs> but I've grown in stature since. <laughs> <laughs> Has it opened the door to Hollywood now? Has it opened the door in Hollywood? Yeah. Oh, ah, yes, I don't know really. Yeah, then, well, um, the producer of the Doctor Who movie kind of took a shine to me, and um, he kept saying, oh, I got this uh, project that I'm working on, and uh, you'll be great in it. And, uh, um, yeah, but it's never cut off the ground yet. But he keeps saying that it's going to happen one day, so who knows. I mean, if it happens, it'd be good fun. Even if it was just a pilot for something, it'd be great. But if, uh, just for the, for the having gone over and done one in Hollywood. Because <laughs> you had a big laugh doing the films, didn't you? With a big laugh. Paul again. Yeah. Oh yeah, Paul and I are all mates, so that was great fun. And uh, uh, we uh, we just had a, a ball making the film. Well, not so much the make. I was what happened after we were making the film in the evening and <laughs> free time. <laughs> didn't you turn up and they were all taking it rather seriously? They did. Yes, they were. I think. I thought it was some religious program they were making. <laughs> <laughs> and then I arrived. It is a religion. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then I arrived and uh, we had a, a very jolly time. And the atmosphere changed, I believe, um, quite a lot. And, uh, um, and then Eric arrived and the atmosphere changed even more, another way. <laughs> he was a master. And, uh, he was a master of being a master. Method actor. <laughs> the real Hollywood type actor. Yeah, he was great. Here, right, we, we, we had that. We were given the most enormous dressing rooms. I had a Pantechnican, a big Pantechnican at the back of our big lorry that you could have gone up into the Yukon in. And um, <laughs> it, 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 was, it was enough room for, uh, you know, three uh, families to live in it. It was just me. And it had lighting for every season. And everything you wanted, everything you could desire, except a blonde. And, um, <laughs> and that's a light, a special light that you have in filming the blonde. <laughs> 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 And uh, so they had all those things, and I was in May's well, this, but I was there a week before Eric arrived. Then Eric arrived, and he decided that what you should do is change the dressing room carpet, so that's what he did. I was thought, oh, I wish I'd known a week earlier, that's what you're supposed to do. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> I want to ask Martin a question. Do you, did you ever work with Mike Tucker? Or do you, have you no, met Mike I didn't. I was the one who made everything we say. Um, I was actually, everything that I did over... 
for 10 or 12 years was always outside the studios in my own workshops. So I never actually met any of the actors. Oh really? So you sort of sat in the I mean, I worked with Blake Seven for five years and I never met any of the actors at all. No wonder you're so sane, that's why. I wondered. I thought, yeah, he's Ed. He's worked for 12 years, Doctor Who. Um, I used to just take the uh, models and props in to visual effects at Western Avenue and uh, just leave them there. And occasionally I'd get phone calls, irate um, special guests, directors like uh, Matt Irvin or Ian Schoon saying, you have bloody props, how can I get in or whatever. But uh, especially on things like Blake 7 where a lot of the stuff was made of plastic and the actors would tend to kind of you know, sit and play with them. Oh! Drop on the floor, and there's another one. Bits would fly off, and out come the sticky tape. And oh, I see, it was the actors' fault that the no, no, was the BBC's fault because they couldn't afford They couldn't afford the good actors, yes. They <laughs> <laughs> were used to work with the props. That's the best. Uh, I'm a Greek fan, you just to get out of the way. If you could go back in time. one. <laughs> if you could go back in time, forget the film now, then that wasn't me. Like I tend to do, and you're the best part of it. <laughs> How would you like to finish Doctor Who? If you had the chance now of sitting down with a script and writing the story with Sophie, how would you like to finish the actual series? Instead of just walking off into bushes? <laughs> I think in no better way than walking off into the bushes with Sophie. <laughs> That's a joke. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> How would I like to finish it? Well, I wouldn't like to finish it personally. If I had my way, I wouldn't have finished it. I would carry on, really. I can't conceive that it should ever be finished for any for economic reasons, for um, uh, you know, artistic reasons, science fiction reasons, for whatever reasons. That there's no reason why it should have been taken off. The only reason why it was taken off was internal BBC politics. Absolutely, it didn't make anyone's career. I mean, that's a sad thing. I mean, that's the main reason. It's utter selfishness in, 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 in an area where um, they, they, it made the career of Verity Lambert and various other people in the early days. And that's what television series do. People start them up, they become successful, they become famous, they go on to bigger and better things. Whereas no one could do that with Doctor Who anymore. It, it, it had become bigger than they, in a sense. So that, <coughs> The only way to make sure you could have a, you know, make a career move uh, was to kill it off, bring in an Eldorado, then get sacked and sent off to another company. <laughs> in fact, what really happened, you know, that's the, that's the, 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 the only reason that I can glean for ever having taken Doctor Who off. I mean, they actually did the same for Blake Seven, because they? they just killed everybody off. And so sorry, you're, you're speaking into your armpit. I know, I know, Blake Seven might have some water. Maybe you have. No, I mean, I mean, oh, it's, it's just armpits, it's, 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 it's just the same kind of thing that they did with Blake Seven. I mean, everybody knows that they got a tremendously successful series there as well. Very, very similar and along the same kind of lines as Doctor Who. And they just killed it off. Um, and despite all the thousands, I mean, we all know how many thousands and thousands of letters were written to the BBC to bring it back. And everybody knows how successful it was, yet the BBC just ignore it. Yeah. And they say, I just don't understand it. Well, so the film, the, the BBC were really worried because there was a slight overrun and it cost them more money to make the film than they'd had anticipated. And they were really worried because I think it was more money than they've ever spent in a long time in something. As far as I know, now they are really pleased because the film has made the BBC a profit. They've now made a profit out of it. And, uh, you know, so are they going to make another series? No. But yeah, it made them a profit. They don't know what's it. It's got the vodka in there now. <laughs> what was that? Is that yours? Yeah. Did you order that? Oh, yes, it will have the vodka in there. Then. <laughs> <laughs> it, did you enjoy doing Ramsey Lynch's bit? And um, would you like to do more of that sort of more, more comedy? Um, did I enjoy it? Yes, I did enjoy doing Rhapsody because being a Scot, I'm one of the few people maybe uh, in, in here who could understand what he was talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and it was uh, without subtitles. I believe that it is very popular in Britain and England, but um, they, they have put sub, you know, they, they dial 888 just to see you. He's trying to be the guest, you to me. Good morning and how are you? Um, <laughs> the thing about it, you said, do I, enjoy, do I do more comedy? Um, I thought I was off to do a comedy. You know, when I got the script, I thought, oh yes, this is obviously funny, and off I went. But it turned out to be a tragic little part. Um, in fact, there was not much that was really comic about it, and it was just, it was odd. It was one of those sort of things, the way the part just happened. And the writer was a bit amazed at it as well. He thought he'd written a funny bit. 
And, and then afterwards, came up and you know, said how much he liked what I'd done with it. But I, I don't think I'd done anything, it's just that's the way it went. And I kept saying to people, I can be funny, honest, I can be funny. And he had the comedy, been a miserable little sock. <laughs> I, but, uh, I, they might ask me back to do more because I am the only living, as far as I know, um, member of Rabsi Nesbitt's um, own family. But I'm, you know, shut up in a lunatic asylum. So I might, maybe I might escape again. Good fun, I can escape. It's good fun working on it. But, um, yes, I'd like to do anything comedy. At the moment, I, I've just finished, though, being um, a, a, a murderer and a rapist and a kidnapper. Yes, I've just finished a film that uh, will be going out on Channel 5 when it comes out. And I'm uh, playing Michael Sams, who came from New York. No, he came from New York, but he lived in New York. And he kidnapped Stephanie Slater and he kept her in a wheelie bin for eight days. Which sounds like comedy, doesn't it? <laughs> it wasn't, it was horrible. Anyway, I played the horrible little man that did it. There's not many laughs there. But I'm doing panto in Hastings. Oh, that's near here, isn't it, Hastings? So anyone that's from around here, hastily to Hastings this Christmas. And you're giving us your dame, aren't you, for the first yes, time? Yes, I'm doing uh, yeah, the Dame and Widow Twanky, that's what I'm doing. For, well, no, actually, I played Dame before, many years ago, for uh, Stratford East. But, uh, that was a long time ago. So, th th there we go. What else can I say? Ah, uh, yes, is the answer. <laughs> <laughs> do, you think, do you think it changed people's perception of you? I mean, in terms of casting. Like, do you think seeing you in Rev C. Nisbet? Well, I, I wonder, I, well, I think maybe Rapsi, seeing me play that part in Rhapsody and Nesbitt might have got me the part of Sam's. Because, I mean, Sam's, he, the way the film's been shot, it looks, you don't, you see it from the perspective of the girl who, when she was kidnapped by him, uh, although she saw him fleetingly when she was showing him around a house, she hardly noticed him, she just noticed this little man and she was just showing him the bathroom, and suddenly he attacked her and kidnapped her and all that. But in the eight days that she was in the wheelie bin and in his workshop, she was blindfolded, but she just suddenly gave, got this impression of a big a man who was powerful and, you know, amazing looking, in fact, because the, she did a, a, her impression of him, and he looks incredibly handsome, and then they got me to play the part. <laughs> I fit the, uh, the bill for what he really looked like. <laughs> That's, I hope more louder, please. <laughs> so, uh, he, 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 he's... It was, but the, the main thing is in the court he breaks down and cries and weeps and does all that. And I think, as I did that in the Rapsi Nesbitt, I think we must have thought, well, we, we need a crier. We need to pick him up. Hello, casting? I want a crier. Yeah, what, what kind of crier? Well, one that weeps. Okay, we'll get one. And they go, who weeps? Oh, he can give tears. Yeah, we'll have him. It's a bit like that, isn't it? It is. <laughs> and funny enough, ghost like I enjoyed making well, one of the best because I thought the, the, the way the Doctor's character had been written was really good. It was like, I thought, oh, yeah, that's quite. I it fitted in with what I was trying to achieve in a way. Um, but when I saw it, I had no idea what it was about. But I believe if you read the book, buy the book and read it, then you will understand it. So it's a terrible plot to sell the book, nothing to do with the <laughs> TV program. <laughs> but uh, it, it becomes, it, it, I mean, what, I think what we found that towards the end of our seasons, um, it did get hectic, and sometimes you didn't know. There was been shot up. You had no time to read the script before you did it. You were being handed script changes. You were also at one point we would, when we did um, the, uh, the the circus so, one, oh, Great Show and Gallery, with Galaxy. We were reading, doing read-throughs for the next one while still shooting the other one, and it got very confusing. So all you did, all you could do, was just learn the lines and not try and not to bump into the monsters. You know, just to make sure that that's what you did. Didn't you? Yeah, it was amazing that the Greatest Show thing, because. Uh, because I wasn't at the read-through for Silver Nemesis um, because I was filming in the tent in the car park in, at L Street because the schedules had gone up the spout because of finding asbestos at Television Centre. So um, the assistant floor manager read in Ace uh, in the read-through. And so when we got to the rehearsal rooms for our... I think we only had, we had two days rehearsal for Silver Nemesis in the end. We were meant to have two weeks and it had been cut down to two days. So we were still like on location going, what's, what's this one all about? You know, what's this scene doing? Um, and uh, so it, we got to rehearsals and we met all the rest of the cast. And Dolores Gray, who was this wonderful American 
Hollywood or uh, actress in, in, in the limousine, you know, the, the woman in the limousine. Um, she kept coming up to me and saying, um, could I have a cup of coffee? Could you get me this? Could you get me that? And I thought, why is she asking me? And then, of course, I suddenly realized that she thought that I was the AFM, and she thought that the, 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 the AFM, who had been in the read-through, was playing Ace. So, um, so it was all a bit complicated, but I didn't have to tell her, so I sort of would go and get her a cup of coffee. And <laughs> give it to her. Um, but, uh, yeah, so it did get terribly complicated and confusing, and Ghostlight was, um, was one of those when we were actually, we did rehearse, we did have time to rehearse Ghost Light, but um, people like Sharon Deuce, who was playing Light, had to try and get to grips with the character, which there were no clues at all about how to play her or anything. And so she'd be going, so, so what, actually, what actually is Light? Um, no, not Light, Control. And uh, what, what, what's going on here? And what? she'd ask a lot of questions, and the director would say, um, well, the thing is, Sharon, um, I don't know, hang on a minute. And he'd rush <laughs> off and phone Mark Platt, the writer, and have her like a, you know, well, uh, she's saying this, and, and what, what, what does she do there, and what does that mean? And then, and then he'd come back and say, um, well, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but I, th I think that Ghostlight really is a very, it's a lovely story, because you can watch it over and over again. And Still not understand. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's the sort of whole atmosphere of us, isn't it, that's yeah. so, so good about it. And also, one of those great things was that they didn't over-light it like they tend to on the, the mysterious scripts. They tend to power loads of light onto it. But in fact, in Ghost Light, they kept a nice low level of lighting, so that it was quite shadowy and mysterious. And that wonderful Victorian set which I just loved. It was fantastic. Stuffed full of all those Victorian knickknacks and things. It was an amazing, amazing set. I suppose it is. Of all the, the sets, the indoor sets, that was the best one, really. I didn't like... I didn't really believe in, you know, all the other ones. You know, they were supposed to be on planets or anything like that. I think it was much better, that, um, that set, because you believe it. But an even further problem was that um, we didn't, as usual, have time to shoot all the scenes. Uh, as they were meant to be in the first block of studios. So by the time we came to the second block, they'd all been changed around again, and, and some scenes had been cut. And then when it went to editing, even more scenes had been cut. So by that time, the story was completely incomprehensible. Cause that's and then we got hold of it. <laughs> <laughs> Big problem with Doctor Who scripts, as you probably know, is that you, you receive this massive you know, script thuds through onto the doormat. And you, you, I mean, in the end, I got to sort of weighing them in one hand and going, ooh, that's 20 minutes over. That's, that's half an hour too much. Oh, really? No, never. Really? Never. Never seen a Doctor Who script. So what, how did you... Never seen a Doctor Who show? <laughs> yeah, quite a few. Um, did you just get instructions? Yeah, I mean, I've... Make a model out yeah, of a squeezy bottle. I would literally bottle. get... I would literally and get... And four yoghurt cups. <laughs> Supposed to shake off this image. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, oh, it's just done the same thing. Yeah. Um, no, we would just get. Uh, the guy would just phone up and say, right, we need six ray guns. Or we want a big green spaceship to fly over camera. And that was it, literally. Or sometimes, if it was Ian Skins, and he was the only effects director I worked with who actually provided drawings, he would do a little sketch and sort of send it through, or I'd go up to visual effects to see it. I never actually ever saw a script. Not but was that quite nice? Because you could just let your imagination... Um, it would have been, well it was, but I mean it would have been nice to have some kind of clue about whether it was a really evil, bad, nasty person ship. Or, I mean I made Serverland ship, I'm sorry going back onto Blake 7, but did Serverland ship and I made it this sort of quite nice looking thing. If I'd known what a right Serverland was, I'd have made it a much more <laughs> evil looking craft. And I think, personally, that I... On other shows, and I, I mean, this doesn't happen with other shows, this just happened with BBC stuff, um, I would get a much bigger description about what the thing was, and I would know to make it a really evil looking ship, you know, bristling with guns or whatever. Um, but no, with Doctor Who, it's just like a spaceship flies over camera. Um, big spaceship flies over camera. Little, little, little shuttlecraft flies past camera. And that was it. So it was, wasn't a lot to go on. I didn't know what technology to bring it from as well. Um, Earth technology ships would tend to look maybe, we'd maybe base them something like on NASA that update them. 
So I would make a thing like a like serverland ship, and I'd realise that it actually looked like it was an Earth-type ship. There had nothing alien about it at all. Whereas in fact, of course, it was supposed to be from a totally different civilization. So that was, a, that was quite a problem, really. And I would often think that the spaceship didn't fit the part it played, personally. But probably, I don't know, other people may not have noticed that. I'm sure they wouldn't have, really. <laughs> no, I mean that. I mean, you know, an innocent you think I'd probably be more, yeah, maybe. What do you think? Because you're into it. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. What did you lot think? Would you have noticed? Yeah. Yeah, but you've been told you're just going to sit here and listen. Some of them should have been awkward. Yeah. Did Michael Sachs have one leg? How far did you go into the realism? Um, well, how well, far did I go to realism? I'm a method actor, listen to this. <laughs> See? That's my head as well. Um, I admire your method acting. Yes, yes. And the other one, um, I've got two small videos. I grew up with two swans and vision on the white sort of Oh, that stuff. explains a lot. <laughs> so, I mean, did you sort of get an image? Because like, I must admit, when you started playing Doctor Who, the first thing I was thinking was, this was the guy who was messing around with Vision Art, and I couldn't get things of like Sylvester the Human motor car out of my head. <laughs> so, <laughs> how, how did you sort of work that out of your system? Because you, you really sort of came through with the second or th third series that you did, and it was wonderful. It was great watching the development. I just wondered how you felt about that. Well, it's more to do in the viewer's mind than it is in the actors. Um, you know, because I, 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 I only played a motor car, I think, or was it a Volvo? I'm not sure what it was. I was playing. Um, um, you know, that I just improvised that on that that morning on this was because it was live. But um, so it was. It's the viewers that they've got to change their minds about how they see an actor. That's how we become typecast in many ways. I mean, not always. Funny enough, that the people who uh, the professionals in our business tend to typecast as much more than viewers do. You know, they've got less imagination. The people are supposed to have all the imagination. Um, the casting directors, they just, you know, get you stuck in one little groove, it's true, isn't it? But, um, so, the answer to that question is, it's uh, how long it took the viewers, because it was years since I did Tiz was, so by the time I came to Doctor Who, I'd forgotten I had been a motor car. <laughs> <laughs> then I met the Daleks and realised, oh yes, I was one of them once. <laughs> yeah, but Michael Sams, I didn't go for the wooden leg. I had a little, the problem is, because, uh, um, Stephanie Slater didn't know he had a wooden leg. When, when, when they put it on Crime Watch, because he, he let her go, she's the first person ever to be released from you know, a kidnap ever in Britain. Normally they get killed and that's it. But he actually took a shine to her and he released her. But they, they still didn't know who he was. And then on Crime Watch, they, um, they played a bit of him phoning um, the, you know, the, for, for the ransom. And she happened to see under her, uh, you know, blindfold. That he was a, ra a railway enthusiast, train spotter person. So she had a, he had a badge on. So that was uh, went out on television. And his first wife recognised it as being him, and phoned up and said, "I think it might be my ex-husband." But the, and then she said, hey, and he, she described it as if it's a wooden leg, and the police all went, mm, "Can't be," because there was no mention of a wooden leg. Surely she would have known if he had a wooden leg, but uh, turned out he did. So that in, in the piece, we try to keep that a, a slight mystery. Because it's, it's her view of him, so you don't actually find out towards the, near the end. But I had to try and, I remember trying to do it so that I had, if you look back and having been in the world of Doctor Who, where everyone views everything on video 5,000 times, backwards, forwards, upside down, and around, <laughs> and I thought, well, in case people view this again, video and view it again, I'll just, I want them to look back and say, oh yes, I can see now he did have a wooden leg. So that was an odd thing, trying to create that, but not actually give it away at the same time. Other people think, just, like, he must be drunk the way he's walking. <laughs> <laughs> How did I get involved with Leaping Leprechauns? Leaping Leprechauns, I don't know, it was a, a film I did, back-to-back, um, -back, two films. One was called Leaping Leprechauns, and the other one, I think, is called Bejabers, and they were made in uh, Romania about two, two years ago, or two summers ago. Um, Jimmy Ellis and myself and uh, various others involved. How, well, the casting director just phoned up my agent, as they do, and, and asked me to go along for it. And I went along, and the, the uh, director, American director, just 
took a shine to me. Uh, maybe I was wearing a funny coat, you know, because I was just, if you wear something odd, you get a job. <laughs> the hat, for the Doctor Who hat, I was wearing that for the interview and I got the job. And it, it's, it's a visual thing and people think, oh yes, they, they see lots of people, they remember um, you because you wore a funny coat. What rather... kind of funny coat were you wearing? Well, you know, it's the one, one that, that explodes got... or something. Yes, yeah, so no, yeah, not make sure. He goes, I, I, no, um, and you pull all the ducks out of it. No, it was, um, you know that one I've got that would have made a really good Doctor Who coat? It's the trench, the trench coat, the, yeah. That one. But it looked leopard cornish. And there was a heat wave on at the same time, so I kept wearing it. <laughs> it makes me look like a leprechaun. Anyway, that's how I got it. I went off and became a leprechaun. It was called, the film was called, at first we were going to call it Teeny Weenies 1 and 2. <laughs> oh, gosh, that was great. <laughs> <laughs> and then we, 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 we spent three months in Romania, uh, just four British actors, and the rest uh, were all American actors. And then the crew, the film crew, the filming crew, the actual uh, they were uh, Italian. Uh, the the rest of the crew were Romanian, and um, it was a very confusing uh, shoot altogether because no one could understand anybody. <laughs> and, uh, the the, but the, the uh, we also had Romanians in it acting, you know, like with Irish accents that were you know just extraordinary. <laughs> <laughs> but I am from Dublin, you can tell. This is from Dublin, yes. <laughs> I'm a little bit of and I will, uh, you know, there's all that going on. Big jabers. Uh, <laughs> we, we did, uh, so we, they, they used to do a bizarre filming. They wouldn't allow us home because they, they were used to Americans flying over from America to Romania filming there. And so they were never allowed to go home because it's such a long way. Whereas we only lived, but, so they would film us extensively, like 23 hour shoots and then let us go for nine days. So we went off roaming around the countryside, exploring it. Coming back nine days later, having no idea what Irish accent we'd used the last time we'd done it. <laughs> in the morning sometime after a 24 hour shoot. It was one of those things. So God, you know, it was goodness knows what it was like when it came through. You know, caught Irish, Javers know. If it's ever shown in Ireland, I'll never be allowed back. <laughs> Sophie's told us how, when you were doing Remembrance of the Daleks, you expressed scruples about the Doctor using a gun, uh, so he gave it to Ace to do. Did you have similar thoughts when you were in Battlefield about the Doctor using the Master's hypnosis to get rid of the bystanders? Did I do that? <laughs> Did I? Oh dear. I can't remember that one. I, I, so I used the hypnosis. What did I, do? I ex did I explode the bystanders? or Did they, they just disappear? I can't remember that. I didn't? They were very angry and they wanted to leave. Oh, right. Oh, well, that wasn't violent, was it? As far as that doesn't seem to me violent, I can't remember that bit. But anyway, um, if you say I did it, I did. Um, yeah, no, I, 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 it, it was. I, the, I just thought that the doctor, you know, as I've said many times, should not have been, should have been above violence because I do think that violence is a human weakness and not a human strength. And that, in a way, it would be rather good if he came from another planet, and there was some superhero he who was actually on the side of um, non-violent. No, no, it's not non-violence, but who wasn't violent? Who didn't wear his underpants on the outside his trousers? You know, <laughs> do things, you know, kind of blow things apart. I wasn't against violence per se in the program because you know, otherwise, you know, Sophie. I was giving Sophie the, the guns to use because also that seemed to fit in with the character. Has been as it was originally written, wasn't it? It was a you know, violent girl. And it, wasn't, it was just, I just felt that it, there ought to be somewhere in uh, all our television, some little area where there was a, a superhero who was known for using his brain more to get out of problems than, um, than his muscle at all, really. Just a thing. But I wasn't, uh, you know, like saying, have no violence in the program at all. Because that's part of the excitement of the people. Well, the well, to be sure, I thought that the question of interfering with, uh, with, with people's free will, which the doctor has always been very much against. Oh, really? <laughs> ah! <laughs> well, there you go. Well, who's the script editor on that? Must, I must speak to him. I didn't know. Um, Oh, I see. It's funny how... how I can't, much I can't, you see, the problem is I can't remember what you're talking about, so I can't defend it. But you're absolutely right. I was terrible, I was wrong, and I should have <laughs> <laughs> I did this thing, it was terrible. It's very difficult sometimes as an actor where you're given uh, something to do and you have no idea of the context of the rest of the, you know, 30-year history or whatever. And you do something, and then somebody says, "Oh, well, why did you do that?" 
because you just have no idea, do you? And, and in the heat of the moment, also when you're, you know, when you're on these very tight schedules and you're, you know, we we were fighting to actually keep a lot of character trait. You know, we were going now. Uh, would Ace do that, or you know, would the Doctor do that? So there was all that going on, wasn't there? You know, and full marks to the production team. They did actually change it a lot of the time when we when we came up with uh, with reasons why we shouldn't do something. Or, but there's just no time, is there, to uh, to sort of really sort out what's going on, even most of the time. So I suppose, it's, in a sense, that's why I say, where's the script editor? Because yeah. the script editor's job to you know look after that, and then. I suppose the producer as well. Or who, I mean, it's something like East End, you know, long-running soaps and things like that. They do have a person whose um, job is to make sure that all these things fit in. You know, the, 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 the storylines and all the philosophies that different characters have are kept. You know, going. Well, so it doesn't on Coronation Street. No, they don't. Because like, <laughs> the, the characters change so much. They? Do they? Well, I think they do. <laughs> I don't watch it of course. No. <laughs> <laughs> And the characters seem to change, you know. I just think that sometimes the script editor, um, I don't actually think they do do that good a job because over a prolonged programme like EastEnders, as you mentioned, characters do seem to change. You suddenly think, well, hang on, then, a few months ago, that character never would have done that. Yeah. I mean, I might be noticing this, but I'm sure it does. I'm sure I suppose I'm not the only person that thinks this. I suppose they have to balance up the, uh, that with the fact that it's got to be an interesting story. They've got to story change it exactly. They've got to uh, twist it. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? Sometimes yeah, characters yeah, yeah. in all sorts of shows you think, well, the other week he said this, and this week he's all benign, and the other week he was really violent. Didn't he? Yeah, the, yeah, the guy in EastEnders, the bar, the guy who runs Watch Band. Yes, he's becoming a nice person. He's becoming a nice person. He's lost his tattoo as well. I don't want to watch it, of course. There was a letter in the Radio Times this week that said about it. Sorry, go on. No, 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 no. Oh, no, no they just mentioned just... in the Radio Times this week, somebody picked up that the writer used to have a tattoo for it being in the um, army or something, and now it's disappeared. Apparently, yeah, well, it's it washing all those dishes behind the bar. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what they put in there, you know, the kind of washing up liquid, but... Um, <laughs> So acid, I yes, that's his mother next door to him. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very pleased to be uh, doing lots of children's telly because I think it's uh, it's a great medium to work in. I'm sure Sylvester will back me up there. It's um, I back you up there, Sophie. <laughs> <laughs> when I when I got Doctor Who, I, I at the same time, and never having done television before, I also got um, a presenting job in a program called Corners, which some of you may have seen. <laughs> and it, I went, it went on for three years, just doing Doctor Who for six months, Corners for six months, Doctor Who. So I, I had this tremendous experience, both of acting on television and, and presenting as well, which are obviously two quite different things. Um, and Corners was great because we played stupid characters and, and you know, sang and danced and did everything. We and did that on Doctor Who as well. <laughs> <laughs> <That's true>. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> And, um, and then I've, I've just sort of continued doing the presenting um, whenever anyone's asked me to do it, really. Um, I've, always, I've never really planned my career as such. I, I just, I love working and I just like being busy. And, um, and so I've always just taken stuff that's interested me. Um, Words and Pictures was one of those things. I, I did a series four years ago, I think it was and um, enjoyed doing it, and it's shown in something like 75% of, of primary schools in the country use words and pictures for teaching children to read and write. And it also seems a quite a nice way of having a good time, earning some money, and being involved in you know, a sort of project greater than myself, if you like, you know, to educate young people, I think is, is pretty cool to, to do. And um, and I, I really enjoy it. I love doing it because they. I'm doing this series this year. I'm, I've been booked from last January till till next January to do a year of words pictures, and um, they tend to tailor the program around what I can do. So they give me a lot of singing to do, and you know, a bit of juggling on last week's show, and and we go out and film, and you know, I get to meet kids and talk to them, which I love as well. So that's good. And um, and then uh, I'm lucky enough to, to be going through a rather good patch at the moment, so I'm doing a lot of, a lot of other children's day. I'm doing a programme called It's a Mystery, which is on, uh, I 
think it's I think it's now on Wednesdays. <coughs> I don't know why they've changed the day from Thursdays to Wednesdays, but that's a, a children's program which is based around sort of well, it's cashing in on the X Files really. It's uh, investigating spooky phenomena, and it's great fun. I mean, we we had Neil Buchanan and, and I. I think you've worked with Neil, haven't you? Neil has has been in children's TV for for donkey's years, and he's now a producer. And uh, we've known each other sort of socially for a few years, but we'd never worked together. And we worked together, and it was just we had an absolutely we had such a ball, and it was uh, great fun. And the programme's been very successful. We're up for an award, and um, we're hoping to do a new series next year. So that's good. And then the Saturday morning as well, which they're all very very different programmes. I mean, it, with it's a mystery. Um, I get to sort of look serious and wear suits and say, what do you think? You know? <laughs> <laughs> Funnily enough, I use my acting for that more than the words and pictures. And then for the Saturday morning, um, it's just a bit mad, really. Isn't it? So it's lovely to be doing three very different things. I, I, I just concur with you about children's television, because I did lots of it. and. Um, I found it really the most exciting piece of uh, parts of television because you had you could you as the actor, the performer, the person were allowed to give more to it than you normally do in drama because you know you you, um, you you do as writ. But um, the the and also the, the the imagination that was allowed to be used in it was great. And I enjoyed doing children's television a lot. Yeah, the input I've had in the program is is great. I mean, they always ask me what I think and. Like for words and pictures, they're commissioning an, uh, a little mini opera for me to do, uh, based on the Emperor and the Nightingale by a composer. I thought it was going to be Emperor's New Clothes. I shall tune in and watch that one someday. <laughs> <laughs> but isn't that fantastic to have an opera commissioned for you, you know, for a children's program? It's just great. And as I was saying yesterday, on Wow on Saturday mornings, you know, I get to play Cilla Black, a Bond girl, and myself in one program, you know, drive a Ferrari, drive, you know, it's, it's um, fantastic. And another thing is that I've never, of all the people who work in children's television, or who I've met who've worked in children's television, have been great, really lovely people to work with, because they all do believe that they are performing a, um, something more than entertaining. There's always the sort of educational strand in there as well. And, um, and everybody's sort of very dedicated to what they're doing, and there's there's none of there's not any bitchiness or um, you know sort of backstabbing or anything like that. Not I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't encountered that. Anymore. I've got a question for Martin. Uh, now that everything's done with computers, well, not everything, but stuff is done with computers. Do you fear for your job? Yeah, um, well, yes. Um, <laughs> basically, yeah. Um, I've lost. Probably nine tenths of the work that I would normally do to computers. Um, and myself and probably half a dozen other model maker, special effects people that I know, have either got no work at all in that line or are, have got the kind of work that I now do, which is either in publishing, which, which is producing models for photographs for books, um, or uh, comic work, which I was involved in for about the last five years doing Thunderbirds and what have you. Um, uh, but other than that, all the the mainstay of my work for many, many years, apart from Doctor Who, uh, was uh, TV commercials. And I would do, I mean, I've made bottom, uh, bars of chocolate, six feet long, so that a little camera could track along the trench in a bar of chocolate. I've done a thing for Malibu drinks, which was a six foot high Malibu bottle shaped like a spacecraft that came from paradise and tastes like heaven. I know. <laughs> I just made the bottle, but it was a six foot high model spacecraft, and that would give me like three months' work. Now that's done in the computer, and, it, I, and I actually, I think it actually costs more to do it in the computer. But it's like I said to somebody yesterday, it's like a pendulum swings between model work, and now it's gone right over to computers. Whereas, in fact, I mean, things like Independence Day, they've actually got a nice balance. I've got people nodding around here, yeah. I mean, they've got models, and they've got computer effects, and they both have a place. But it seems within TV commercials that they've gone right over now to using just computer-generated images. And I think it's very sad because um, people have said to me, oh, well, why, if that's the case, why don't you go and move it to computers? But I have no interest in creating an image in a computer. The buzz that I get is from working with my hands, uh, carving pieces of wood, making things, painting things with my hands. And it's not the same in a computer. So yeah, I mean, I've lost a lot of work that way. And I, it's, it's a great shame. I mean, I, I think that 
personal is, it's a personal view. Uh, things like Babylon 5, which are done entirely in computers. Some of the shots do work very, very well, but some of them look so clean and pristine. They just look too good to be real. And I think they could do with a few model shots in there, but then I'm, I'm a model maker. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about special effects, um, I'd just like to say how much I enjoyed the way that you regenerated into Paul McGann with all the face twisting. How did they do then? Oh, that's me you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> you enjoyed the fact that I... was never Paul McGann. Yes. No. no. You enjoyed the fact that I, I turned into Paul McGann. <laughs> Please. <laughs> yeah, ah, well, no, because I, I, um, I, I found that a bit surprising when it came to that bit. When they put me on a very freezing piece of steel in, a, in the, the only... Um, snowstorm they've had in Vancouver in years, in a <laughs> hospital where they, we were, there was half of it was still working, but the half that we were filming in, the X-Files had come in, and somehow destroyed the, um, the week before, destroyed the, uh, uh, the heating system, so it was freezing, <laughs> and you were arriving. And um, so I was just lying up there, on, you know, just a bit of cloth over me, freezing like that, and they suddenly said, make some faces, and I thought, as a joke, I went, oh. <laughs> <laughs> concentrates on doing films, so that's why he, he, he's, he's never been seen in the West End or uh, the National, whereas he used to work in the theatre for a while, but now he doesn't because he got stage fright, so he's scared of going on a stage in front of an audience. That's the basic problem he has with the thought of a convention, um, that he, although I believe he did do, uh, he did go to the, um, with Neil and I, 10th anniversary in Birmingham, and managed to do that, and that was quite successful, I believe. It was a bit like a convention, um, so maybe that might uh, soften him a bit. Also, he has an agent who used to be uh, a Doctor Who companion, and uh, I don't think she's all into conventions either. <laughs> so she, you know, she might put him off. So if, one can, if anyone can get in touch with Janet and sweet talk her into talk <coughs> Paul into doing it, he might do it. And if you ask me, I'll say, yeah, do it. I'll come along and I'll hold your hand. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> they, they, uh, well, funny enough, when we were doing the film in Canada, uh, it was supposed to finish it at the weekend that I was in LA doing a convention there. And he said over a couple of pints of Guinness in an Irish pub in Vancouver that um, I'll come down uh, to uh, the convention in disguise. They won't know who I am by then, you know, it's all maybe it'll be a secret. And I can come in in disguise and hang around the convention and have a look at it. But sadly, they overran, so that that never happened. So that might have been quite interesting if we could have 
got him to come down and do that, and then I could have exposed him. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know, just shit. You know, Bob McGann is there. That's all. Yes, anyway. <laughs> um, I'm such a laugh on that one. I've no idea. Anyway, um, so that was the thought. Bonnie Langford. Ah! Now, Bonnie did a convention in Chicago. Go. The 20th anniversary, I think. And that was a pretty tense experience for quite a lot of people involved, I believe. I wasn't there. And Bonnie didn't really enjoy it. And um, so when she came back, she didn't want to do any. Now, I've met Bonnie a few times since, you know, the last three or four years. And when I meet her, she does say that she would like to go to a convention. She just made that statement. She would really like to. And I think it would be great for Bonnie to go because. Especially, I mean, she's a great entertainer, and she would be wonderful for the cabarets, if for nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, she, uh, I suppose she did get a bit of a knocking from some areas, you know, so maybe she's a bit scared of, you know, sitting on the stage and people going up and saying, um, oh, I love Doctor Who, and I think the companions are wonderful, and Bonnie, you're my least favourite. <laughs> <laughs> These are questions mm. and things that people do actually say to you in public places. I mean, it happens to me lots of times. People come up and say, oh, Doctor Who's brilliant. Yeah. I've got 25 um, books and 35 postcards and 12 T-shirts. Would you sign them, please? <laughs> oh, I think this story was one of that was great. And uh, you're my fifth favourite Doctor. <laughs> <laughs> I just smile and say, oh, thank you very much. <laughs> 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 Some people don't find that amusing, but everybody's one of them, I don't know really. But, so maybe that's why she did But I do, I do think that um, she would, you know, be quite happy to go to conventions now, so... You might not find... Maybe her agent... You see, sometimes, like, she might have said, instructed her agent years ago that she didn't want to, and now agent, you know, say no. So there might be other ways you've got to get to Bonnie. Like, uh, go along and see her in a show, and then kind of... She'd be quite pleased if you paid for a ticket and then asked her. She must say, like, I would come. <laughs> I went to see her in, um, she was doing her own one woman show at the Green Room, the Green Room, uh, which is the, the Cafe Royal in London. She was absolutely brilliant. It was, I don't, did anyone else see that? She was just fantastic. She did, um, it was a whole evening of her singing and um, she's just brilliant. She did some very funny stuff. She did um, songs from the musicals and really showed her whole range as a performer. I mean, she did sort of sexy songs, a really wonderful Tom Lehrer song um, about being tone deaf. It's called I'm Tone Deaf. And it was, it's so, she, her timing was brilliant. And I was just so cross that she has got such a bad press. I mean, she got great reviews and I was really pleased for her for that because people still see her as Violet Elizabeth Bock from Just William. And that was what? 25 years ago or something? To, no, she'd been an embryo then. But she, was, <laughs> she was screaming even then. Yeah. <laughs> but it, it is incredible, isn't it? That thing of typecasting, how... Because uh, she's been doing... She did some stuff on Radio 4, didn't she? With, was it Christopher Casanova? She did some thriller things, 1920s stuff. Uh, because it was on the radio, it was quite good because nobody really realised it was her. And, uh, you know, she... I think she's, she's just caught. There's a lady making rude signs at me. I am holding two fingers up. They did that for me yesterday. Does that mean two minutes, two questions, two hours? Two minutes. One more question. Who's going to Yes, you had your hand up first, madam. How does your question feel about this death scene um, being cut by the BBC? Oh, the Death Scene and Doctor Who thing, yeah, yes, um, that, um, well, pissed off, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> See, look, I was upset him. <laughs> sorry, I just, that's how angry I was. <laughs> uh, well, how do I feel? Well, I wasn't very pleased, really. I just thought it was a bit balmy um, to, to, to do that. Uh, you know, and, oh, it's just, the, you know, the whole thing of giving a script, as I said earlier, that, you know, I had 15 minutes involvement in it with quite a lot of words. Then suddenly when I get the other script, it's cut down, and then I do it, and then it's they cut down even more in America, they cut bits out, and then when it comes over here, there's even more cut. By the time it gets to Iceland, I won't be in it. <laughs> so, you know, it just, it's, it's very annoying, you know, and, and it was unnecessary, just totally unnecessary. I don't see, I mean, because the thing is that everybody knew, you know, they were saying violence, it's can't do this, Mrs. Mary Whitehouse will turn in her bed. Um, <laughs> she's still alive, she shouldn't be, but anyway, never mind. <laughs> all that stuff, you think, oh, 
the, everyone knows the, the doctor has got to survive. He's, got, he's not. He's dying. It's, you know. It's not as if you know what I mean. That it's no one ever. Anyway. It was such a dramatic scene, though. And it was, and it was good that it should be dramatic. And that that yeah. bit where I suddenly sat up and screamed at the camera. I mean, that was like you want. That's what people want. You know. It's like oh, and then you realise. You know, that, that's part of the the, the fun of it all. <laughs> storytelling. That story. You know, real storytelling. And children are told stories. I mean, I've told stories to my kids that frighten me when I'm telling them. <laughs> you know, and I, I, they have to pat me on the back. And say, it's all right, Dad. It's only a story. Carry on. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, that's part of the fun, isn't it? That's part of the fun. And it's not that it was in any way kind of um, you know kind of horrifying and give people nightmares. I don't think because it. it comes to a conclusion. A new, young, handsome doctor passes away and another one takes over. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you laughing so much? <laughs>